This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is the last episode in the series, The Devil's Luck, where I'm sharing cases about people who survived some of the worst killers in true crime history. In this week's episode, a young couple out for a leisurely day at the lake find themselves faced with one of the most infamous killers of the 20th century. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were victims of a brutal attack by a hooded man who called himself the Zodiac. They survived the initial attack after being left for dead, but still faced a fierce battle to summon help. Only one would survive. This is chapter three of The Devil's Luck, The Zodiac Killer Survivor. Saturday, September 27, 1969, was a clear and warm day in California's Napa Valley. Lake Berryessa, Napa County's largest lake, was a popular spot for boaters, fishers, and picnickers, especially on a beautiful fall day. But it was now after 6.30 p.m., and most of the lake's visitors had already departed with only a few stragglers remaining. Ronald Fong was operating one of the last boats on the lake. He had been out for a day of fishing and was just about to return to the boat dock when he heard someone calling from the shore. Slowing his boat down, he heard the voice a little louder now. He peered onto the shore and saw two people trying to get his attention. He drove the boat closer, but was still far from the beach. He shielded his eyes, trying to see who might be calling. All at once, he let out a startled cry. He observed two figures waving their arms. They appeared to be covered in blood and cried out that they'd been stabbed. Fong felt frozen in place, wondering if his brain was translating the scene correctly. Neither he nor his boat moved for several minutes. He then moved it a bit closer. The figures were half kneeling, half laying on the ground, calling out weakly and waving their arms. They appeared to be in great distress, but now Fong worried about how to help. He had no supplies other than a fishing pole, tackle, and some water. He called out to them that he would take his boat to shore and summon help. The young man on shore, desperately trying to get the attention of boaters, was 20-year-old Brian Hartnell. He'd stopped at the lake with a friend, 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard, just before 4 p.m. They'd spent some time lying on the grass and talking when a masked man approached them with a gun. The man tied them up, saying he needed money and a car. The couple had been cooperative, but the masked man inexplicably produced a large knife and began stabbing them repeatedly before walking away. Brian had tried desperately to flag someone down as he and Cecilia grew weaker, losing blood quickly and in great pain. He'd finally been able to get the attention of fisherman Ronald Fong, but after he saw Fong boat away from him, he'd begun to lose hope of being saved. He decided he had to try another way. He began crawling toward the road. Meanwhile, Fong had reached Rancho Monticello Resort, located two miles away, and rushed on shore to alert park rangers of what he'd seen. Ranger Sergeant William White was on routine patrol around Lake Berryessa when he received the call from park headquarters at 6.55 p.m. about a possible stabbing on the lake. White met Fong at the resort to return with him to the scene by speedboat. His partner, Ranger Dennis Land, continued in the pickup truck to the lake. By the time they arrived, Brian Hartnell had made it about 300 yards up the trail, almost to the road, when he collapsed. His progress had been slow, due to blood loss, causing him to black out repeatedly. When he was conscious, his legs were so weak it was like moving dead weight. He didn't give up, knowing he had only one shot to save his life and his friend's life. Oh God, I don't want to die, he repeated as he inched his way up the road. He finally heard a car approaching, Ranger Land had found him lying in the road, covered in blood. The boy was still conscious and calling out for help. 
He first said that his girlfriend was out on the island. Land quickly got Brian into the truck and hurried down to the scene. Sergeant White arrived at the beach and found Cecilia lying on the ground with what appeared to be multiple stab wounds. She was still conscious and in a tremendous amount of pain. At one point, she cried out to the rangers to do something to put her out of her misery. Ranger Land arrived with Brian soon after, and an ambulance was called. Sergeant White also radioed park headquarters and had them contact the sheriff's department. It had been at least an hour since the attack. Brian and Cecilia were in and out of consciousness as they waited for the ambulance. Brian was able to share with the sergeant that they had been stabbed by a man wearing a dark hood over his face and dark clothing. He told him the man stated he was an ex-convict from Colorado and was trying to make his way to Mexico. The ambulance arrived and transported the victims to Queen of the Valley Hospital, about an hour from the lake. Detective Sergeant Kenneth Narlow, with the Napa Valley Sheriff's Office, was assigned to lead the investigation into the stabbing at the lake. He arrived at the crime scene and spoke with anyone who might have witnessed the masked man or anything else suspicious that day. Brian Hartnell's white 1956 VW Carmen Ghia was still parked on Knoxville Road. When the sergeant walked around to the driver's side door, he stopped dead in his tracks. On the door, written in black felt-tip pen, was a message. Vallejo was the first word. Below it was written a series of dates. 12-20-68, 7-4-69, September 27-69, the last being the current date. Next to it, the time 6-30 was written. At the bottom of the message were two more words, by knife. And at the very top of the message on the door, a symbol had been drawn, a circle with two crossed lines through it. The dates and symbol were very familiar to the sergeant and, in fact, to practically anyone in Northern California who'd been following the news. They were the dates of two prior killings, both attacks on young couples in Vallejo, California, about a half an hour south of Napa. In both instances, police received communication from a person claiming to be the killer who called himself the Zodiac. At about the same time Sergeant Narlow discovered the writing on Brian Hartnell's car, a call came into the Napa County Police Department. At 7.40 p.m., the phone rang at the main desk. The desk officer listened as the caller said slowly, almost inaudibly, I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of park headquarters. They are in a white Volkswagen Carmen Gia. I am the one who did it. The officer asked for the man's name and location, but got no response. The line was still open, and the officer could hear noises in the background, but the man was gone. The call was traced to a payphone located just four and a half blocks from the police station at a car wash in Napa. The killer must have left the scene immediately after stabbing the two victims and writing the cryptic message on the car. He was unaware that the young couple was still alive. The unnamed suspect, who called himself the Zodiac, had become known to the police and the public just a few months before the attack at Lake Berryessa. A letter arrived at three different newspaper offices during the week of August 1, 1969. The San Francisco Chronicle, the Vallejo Times-Herald, and the San Francisco Examiner received letters detailing two previous attacks on young couples that only the killer could know. On December 20, 1968, David Faraday, 17, and Betty Lou Jensen, 16, were parked on a gravel lot near Lake Herman Road, just at the border of Vallejo and the town of Benicia. They had just left a Christmas concert at the local high school. Faraday parked his mother's Rambler in a secluded area that local youth used as a lover's lane. Just minutes later, they were shot and killed with a 22 caliber weapon. David had been shot once at point-blank range in the back of the head. Betty Lou was shot five times in the back. It appeared she attempted to flee the vehicle after seeing her boyfriend shot, but was gunned down just 28 feet from the car. Seven months later, on the 4th of July, 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Michael Majot drove to Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo. At around midnight, the couple sat in Darlene Farron's parked car when a second car parked behind them. Majot, who would survive the attack, described how a flashlight was shown in their face before the man opened fire. 
The shooter pumped five bullets into the passenger side window, hitting them both. Bajot said the shooter left, but returned a minute later and shot them each twice before driving away. Darlene Farron was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Just a few minutes after the shooting, the Vallejo Police Department received an anonymous phone call from a man who said he wanted to report a double murder. He described the area, the car at Blue Rock Springs Park, and the weapon used. He then added, I also killed those kids last year. Then he said goodbye and hung up. The call was traced to a gas station directly across the street from the Vallejo Sheriff's Office. Clearly, the Lover's Lane killer, as he would first be called, was taunting the cops. The taunting continued with a series of letters received by newspaper offices less than a month later. The killer's first letter, received on August 1st and sent to all three newspapers, was signed with just a symbol, a crossed circle. In it, the writer claimed responsibility for the Lake Herman Road murders and the attack on the couple at Blue Rock Springs Park. He gave details of both shootings, including the type of weapon used in each. Each of the three letters contained one-third of a coded message written in random symbols. The killer demanded that the cipher be printed on the paper's front page or, quote, I will go on a kill rampage. I will cruise around all weekend, killing lone people in the night. He threatened to kill up to a dozen people if his demand wasn't met. He said that hidden in the cipher was his identity. The newspapers printed some of the text of the letter without publishing a copy of the letter itself. The cipher was included. Meanwhile, the coded message was sent to several government agencies, including the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Administration, to have experts attempt to break the code. But it would be two ordinary citizens, a 41-year-old high school history teacher and his wife, who would solve the cipher. It took Donald and Betty Hardin just the better part of their weekend to reveal the message government agencies could not even with all their sophisticated tools. The cipher, with some deliberate or accidental misspellings, read, I like killing people, because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest, because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and all that I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collection of slaves from my afterlife. Although the killer reneged on his promise to reveal his identity, the cipher ended with random letters that some believed might be an anagram for the killer's real name. Or it could have just been nonsense that made the cipher more challenging to solve. In news interviews, Vallejo's chief of police doubted that the letter writer was the killer. But the letter writer appeared to be proud of his cowardly act of gunning down innocent youth and wanted to make damn sure he got the credit for it. To this end, he sent another letter detailing the Vallejo shootings. This time he identified himself by a nickname that would become infamous. This is the Zodiac speaking. It began. Not yet aware that the code had already been cracked, he taunted the police, asking if they were having fun trying to decipher the message. He also said he could hit his targets in the dark by taping a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of his gun. The next message from the Zodiac would not come until it was scribbled on the door of Brian Hartnell's car. It's the fall of 2017 in Rancho Tehama, California. A man and his wife are driving to a doctor's appointment when another car crashes into them, sending them flying off the road. Disoriented, they stumble out of the car, only to hear dozens of gunshots whizzing past them. This is just a chapter of a much larger nightmare unraveling in their small town. This is Actually Happening presents a special limited series called Point Blank, shedding a light on the forgotten spree killings of Rancho Tehama, where a lone gunman devastated a small town attacking eight different locations in the span of only 25 minutes. Overshadowed by the Las Vegas shooting that dominated the headlines just weeks earlier, this small community quickly faded from view and was left alone to pick up the pieces. The series follows five stories of people connected to the incident, from a father that drew the gunman away from a local school to the sister of the shooter. 
These are riveting stories that will stick with you long after you listen. This is actually happening brings you real life stories that will have you asking, if I ever faced a situation like this, what would I do? Each episode of This Is Actually Happening draws me in and keeps me riveted until the very end to see what will happen next. Follow This Is Actually Happening wherever you listen to podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. I'd like to introduce you to Dipsy, the app that takes your love life to a whole new level. With hundreds of sexy audio stories, you can now live out your wildest fantasies in a safe and fun way. Whether you're straight or queer, Dipsy has something for everyone. Dipsy stories are voice acted by talented performers, bringing scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. And what sets Dipsy apart is that it was created by women for women, with a focus on empowering female sexuality. But that's not all. At Dipsy, they believe in inclusivity, which is why half of their stories are voice acted by people of color. They're proud to offer a diverse range of experiences that reflect the world we live in today. So if you're ready to spice up your love life, download Dipsy today. Dipsy stories are waiting for you, ready to take you on a journey of pleasure and exploration. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash once. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash once dipsystories.com slash once. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were rushed to Queen of the Valley Hospital. Brian was stabbed in the back six times as he lay face down on the ground. One of the stab wounds went directly through a lung and nicked his heart. He lost a significant amount of blood but survived his attack. Cecilia Shepard had many more stab wounds to her back, side, and front, and several slash-type injuries. She was conscious when found, but suffered shock and blood loss, causing her to lapse into a coma soon afterward. She, like Brian, underwent emergency surgery, but would not regain consciousness. She died as a result of two primary stab wounds two days later on the evening of September 29th. Over 1,100 people attended her funeral. The service was held at Pacific Union College's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Cecilia Shepard was laid to rest at St. Helena Cemetery in Napa County. Brian Hartnell was interviewed by a Napa County Sheriff's Department detective while he was still in his hospital bed recovering from surgery. He gave investigators their first fully detailed description of the Zodiac Killer. Brian Calvin Hartnell was born in Walla Walla, Washington on July 1, 1949. He had recently turned 20 years old at the time of the attack and was a pre-law student, a junior attending Pacific Union College. As it was called, PUC was a private liberal arts college in Napa County, affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Both Brian and Cecilia were raised as Seventh-day Adventists. Brian's father, Calvin Hartnell, was a minister in the church, although Brian would later say he hadn't been, quote, too much of a Christian himself. When he faced death at the hand of his attacker, he relied on his faith and cried out to God for help, he told detectives. Cecilia Shepard, born to Robert and Wilma Shepard, was born in India on New Year's Day, 1947, and raised in Redding, California. She had two sisters, Kathleen and Carolyn. Brian and Cecilia had dated two years earlier when they'd been in school together. Cecilia had left to attend another college, majoring in music. She had sung in several classical music recitals just the previous spring. Cecilia was living in Loma Linda, California, and was visiting Pacific Union College over the weekend to collect some personal belongings that were still stored in a dorm. She, Brian, and several other friends were gathered at the school cafeteria when Brian asked if she was busy that afternoon. He invited her to do something together, suggesting they drive into San Francisco. Brian had a car he was proud of and loved to drive, a white 1956 Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Cecilia agreed. The couple stopped in the nearby town of St. Helena and then agreed to drop off some other students on their way out of town. 
By the time they were done with all these errands, it was growing late in the day, and they decided not to drive into San Francisco, as they just have to rush back. Students at PUC were expected to attend worship services in the evening, and Brian was worried he wouldn't return on time. Instead, they decided to head to a spot that they used to go to together, nearby Lake Berryessa. But once they got there, he couldn't find their special spot and parked his car at a random spot on the north side of the lake. Later, when a reporter asked whether he had taken Cecilia out to the lake, hoping to rekindle their romance, he said, quote, I loved Cecilia, and yes, I was hoping we could rekindle our love for each other. You know, maybe we would have gotten married and had kids, end quote. He parked the car on the edge of Knoxville Road, and the couple walked about a quarter of a mile down a peninsula that looked out over the lake. It was surrounded by water during the wetter seasons, forming an island. They saw a big shade tree towards the peninsula's tip and sat under it. It was really beautiful out there, Brian said. I lay down on my back, and she lay down on her stomach beside me. We were just talking, you know, kind of reminiscing about old times and stuff. Then he heard rustling leaves behind him. He didn't have his glasses on, so Brian asked Cecilia to look and see where the sound was coming from. She answered, Oh, it's some man. She said he was alone. Then Cecilia said, He just stepped behind a tree. Brian assumed the man was going to, quote, take a leak. That's the only thing I could think of, end quote. Suddenly, Cecilia squeezed his arm and said, Oh my God, he's got a gun. Before the man had gone behind the tree, she had caught a glimpse of him. He was stocky, but more powerfully built than fat. He had dark brown hair. His clothes were dark in color, perhaps black, she thought. When he emerged, he was wearing a hood over his head. It was black, shaped square on top, with four pointed corners. The hood hung down over him almost to his waist. It was sleeveless, and on the front of it was a white sewn-on or embroidered symbol, a crossed circle like the mark you'd see if you peered through a gun scope. On the hood were slits for his eyes and mouth. Brian noticed that the man was wearing clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes. He wore military-style boots that he'd tucked his pant legs into. A gun holster was attached to his belt on one side. On the other was a long bayonet-type knife inside a sheath. White plastic clothesline hung in a loop protruding from his jacket. All of his clothing was black. Brian, who'd moved several times as a boy when his father was sent to minister at different parishes, learned to make friends easily and was confident in speaking to strangers. He was also a level-headed young man whose nature was to think through a situation before reacting. He now used these skills with the oddly costumed stranger who stood over him and Cecilia, pointing a gun at them. I talked to him, Brian told the detective. I've read about the criminal mind and everything, you know. I thought, well, maybe the guy really does need help. The man spoke calmly from beneath the hood. I want your money and your car keys, he said. Brian described his voice as younger, between 20 and 30 years old. He spoke in a monotone, was soft-spoken, and, quote, kind of a drawl, but not a southern drawl, according to Brian. Brian told the man that he only had about 50 cents on him, but he was willing to assist him in some other way if he needed help. The man said, no, time's running short. He said he needed Brian's car to go to Mexico. I'm an escaped convict from Deer Lodge, Montana, he explained calmly. I've killed the prison guard there. I've stolen a car and I have nothing to lose. I'm flat broke. Brian threw him his keys and said he had no money. He tried to reason with him, saying, Well, man, wouldn't you rather be stuck on a robbery charge than a threat of homicide? As they stood talking about what the man wanted, Brian noted more details. The man stood between 5'11 and 6'1 and weighed approximately 225 to 250 pounds. He was wearing black gloves and baggy pleated slacks. He didn't appear fat except for his stomach, which protruded over his belt. Finally, Brian told him, Look, you're really wasting time with me. I've got a billfold and this much change and that's it. He told detectives he didn't believe the gun was loaded. He thought that the hooded man might be bluffing to scare them into complying. Brian didn't understand the term when the gunman said that the car he was driving was, quote, hot. He thought the man was describing a fast car. The man had to explain that he'd meant it was stolen. The hooded man removed the clothesline from his belt 
and approached the couple. Brian looked at the knife he had strapped to his belt. It was large, about 11 or 12 inches long, with a broad blade. He described it later as a bayonet with a hardwood handle. White surgical tape was wrapped around the handle. The blade was sharpened on both sides. The man now directed the couple to lie face down on the ground, saying he was going to tie them up. Brian now became defiant and stood up, protesting. The man threatened to shoot him and ordered him to the ground. Lying face to face now with Cecilia, Brian whispered, I think I can get that gun. Do you mind? The way he had been holding the gun, Brian thought he might have a chance to grab it before he could pull the trigger. Cecilia looked scared, and Brian was already having second thoughts. Quote, The only reason I didn't, he later said, was I figured if I screwed up and somebody got hurt, I was going to get blamed for trying to be a hero. End quote. He decided since it wasn't just his life on the line, he'd cooperate with the gunman. As far as he could tell, he just wanted to rob them. Brian hoped he'd be on his way once he'd tied them up. They would have to figure out a way once he was gone to call for help before it got too dark. They could spend the whole night tied up if they couldn't get free, he thought. The man told Cecilia to tie Brian with the clothesline first. Brian was face down and she was directed to hogtie him hands to feet. She did so, tying the clothesline loosely. Afterward, the gunman made Cecilia also lie face down and he tied her tightly. He then tightened Brian's bindings. The man still made no move to leave, and Brian kept talking to him, and the man continued to respond calmly. A few minutes passed when the man said, quote, I'm getting nervous. The sun was setting and it was growing dark. Brian asked him about the gun. Do you have bullets in there, he asked. The man pulled out the clip and showed him the bullets. After Brian saw him put the gun back in the holster, he turned to Cecilia. Just before turning his head, he saw a flash. Then he felt the knife go into his back. Brian made a loud guttural noise and Cecilia turned to see what had happened. The man repeatedly plunged the knife into his back while Cecilia screamed. Blood spattered her face and she became hysterical. When Brian finally collapsed from shock and pain, the man turned to the girl. She begged and screamed at him to stop as she tried to turn her body to get as far away as possible. When the knife struck her, it hit her in the side, breaking her ribs. She was then struck in the back several times before she rolled onto her back. He continued stabbing, hitting her once in each breast, stomach, and groin. The 100-pound girl was stabbed 10 times and slashed many more times by the knife as she fought to escape. Brian, who'd passed out for a moment, came to and saw Cecilia fighting for her life. He couldn't bear to watch and shut his eyes, frozen in horror. He remained still, playing dead, hoping the man would end his attack soon. His wish was granted when the man stood up, sheathed his knife, and walked slowly back the way he'd come. He returned to his car parked behind the Carmen Ghia. He took nothing away with him. Both Brian's wallet and car keys were left behind on the ground. Before driving away, he took out a felt tip marker and wrote a message on Brian's car door. Incredibly, both Brian and Cecilia remained conscious, but they knew that time was of the essence to get help. They were both losing blood and were in much pain. Slipping into shock was also a threat to their lives. Brian later said, My only strength was knowing two things. One, that I did not want to die. And two, that I felt whatever was going to be was going to be, but I was going to try my damnedest to stay alive. He knew the first thing they had to do was find a way to get him untied, so he could go for help. He twisted himself into a position to get his teeth on Cecilia's bindings. Slowly and in great pain, he succeeded in getting them untied. Cecilia then worked on the knots around Brian's wrists. Quote, He tied me pretty tight, Brian said. I really don't know to this day any reason why she was able to get the cords undone, considering the weakness of her condition. Once Brian was free, it took a few moments to use his hands, which had gone numb in the 30 minutes they had been tied tightly together. Brian first thought to crawl up the trail for help, but found that impossible in his weak state. This was when he and Cecilia began looking for boats on the lake and trying to signal their distress to those closest to the beach. When Ronald Fong drove his boat away from them to get help, 
Brian thought he wasn't coming back, perhaps not wanting to get involved. He decided it was up to him to save them. Before leaving, Brian kissed Cecilia, saying, Well, I'm going to try and get help. As he started toward the road, his vision kept going black. Quote, My mind was never black, but my vision was. So I lay down. Then in a little while, I'd get up and go another 20 feet. End quote. This happened repeatedly until he finally made it about 300 yards up the trail and heard the ranger's truck approaching. Brian couldn't forgive himself for Cecilia's death. He kept going over reasons he could have done things differently, believing then, maybe, she'd still be alive. If he hadn't asked her to leave campus with him, or if they'd gone to San Francisco as he'd first planned, or if he'd tried for the man's gun instead of believing that they weren't in any danger. He remembered when Cecilia first said she'd seen the man duck behind the tree. Quote, I wish I would have listened to Cecilia. I should have clued in that something wasn't right, but I didn't listen to my gut instinct, and thanks to me, Cecilia is dead today, end quote. Brian even seemed to have more compassion towards the killer than himself. He agreed to speak to investigators while still in the hospital because, quote, I just don't want this to happen to anybody. Of course, he might have had his reasons, I don't know, he said of his attacker. Asked what he thought the killer's motive might be for stabbing them, Brian said, I think he got rattled. His hands were shaking. Two weeks after the Zodiac attacked Brian Hartnell and killed Cecilia Shepard, he struck again. This time he shot and killed 29-year-old cab driver Paul Stein in San Francisco. The San Francisco Chronicle received a letter from the Zodiac two days later. In the envelope was a portion of Stein's bloody shirt. On November 18th, the fourth cipher, 340 symbols long, was sent to the Chronicle. It was not solved until 2020. The FBI released a statement in 2021, stating that they were aware that, quote, a cipher attributed to the Zodiac Killer was recently solved by private citizens. The Zodiac Killer case remains an ongoing investigation for the FBI San Francisco Division and our law enforcement partners. Even though decades have gone by, we continue to seek justice for the victims of these brutal crimes. Due to the ongoing nature of the investigation and out of the respect for the victims and their families, we will not be providing further comment at this time, end quote. The Zodiac continued communicating by sending letters and even greeting cards to news organizations until 1974. A month after the Lake Berryessa attack, a man called into a television show claiming to be the Zodiac and saying he needed help. I'm sick. I don't want to go to the gas chamber, the caller said to talk show host Jim Dunbar. This call was considered most likely a hoax, although it was thoroughly investigated. The hoax appears to have been confirmed with the cipher that was solved in 2020. In part, the cipher read, That wasn't me on the TV show. I am not afraid of the gas chamber. Over the decades, several have made the list of potential Zodiac killer suspects. Arthur Lee Allen, Richard Gakowski, Rick Marshall, and Lawrence Kane were all thought to be the most likely suspects. However, the Zodiac killer was never positively identified or caught. His identity, and whether he is still alive today, remain a mystery. Many books, documentaries, and podcasts have all covered the Zodiac case extensively, so I will not attempt to do so, as it is a case that can take many hours to cover. A great resource if you're interested in learning more about this case is Robert Gray Smith's book, Zodiac. In 2017, the History Channel released a docuseries titled The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer. Or if you'd like to listen to an in-depth podcast on this case, I recommend True Crime Garage's five-part series on the Zodiac, released in 2021. This case has also been portrayed in many feature films, including the 1971 classic Dirty Harry. A detective, played by Clint Eastwood, hunts down a serial killer in San Francisco, based on the Zodiac. This killer calls himself Scorpio. Get it? Scorpio? Zodiac sign? Yeah, you get it. One of my favorite movies based on the Robert Graysmith book was released in 2007. The film Zodiac stars Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., Mark Ruffalo, and Anthony Edwards as the four people at the center of the hunt for the Zodiac killer during the 1970s. 
Zodiac survivor Brian Hartnell is portrayed in one scene of this movie by Patrick Scott Lewis. Hartnell himself has a walk-on cameo in the film. He was contacted by the movie's producer and worked with the director David Fincher and the screenwriter as a consultant. Hartnell reports that he appreciated that the film did not portray gratuitous violence and tried to get the details as close to the actual events as possible. He said about his and Cecilia's on-screen depictions, quote, It's a pretty good representation of what I look like and what Cecilia looked like. If you want to see his cameo, he walks through the background at 1 hour, 36 minutes, and 28 seconds in the non-director's cut version of the film. Brian Hartnell continued his education, receiving his Juris Doctor degree in 1975. He practiced law in Redlands, California. He also served as a producer for his church's televised worship services. He married Dr. Monica Newman, an anesthesiologist, and they have two sons, Benjamin and Jonathan. He is now 73 years old. One final note. There was one other survivor of the Zodiac Killer attacks whom I mentioned briefly. Michael Majot survived the shooting in Vallejo's Rock Springs Park. However, he spent decades avoiding the media, and unlike Brian Hartnell, gave limited interviews about his attack to the press. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. There are a few details I wanted to cover, but time didn't allow me to do so in this episode. So once again, I'll be releasing a bonus episode on Patreon to share what was left on the cutting room floor. I'll briefly discuss a couple of the more interesting suspects thought to be the Zodiac and tell you which one Brian Hartnell believes to be his attacker. I'll give you a few details about how Brian helped investigators during the hunt for the Zodiac. Finally, I'll share a few theories of my own about Zodiac's motivations for the random serial murders. And I'll talk a little bit about the solving of the last Zodiac cipher, 50 years after it was first received. To listen to this bonus episode and many others, as well as hear every episode of Once Upon a Crime ad-free and before everyone else, become a Patreon member. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to get more details and join. There's a link in the show notes. Follow or subscribe to Once Upon a Crime on your favorite podcast app or YouTube. Next week, I'll begin a new series for April, and it's going to be a blast. I'll have a co-host all month, something never before heard on Once Upon a Crime. Together, we will share so many crazy true crime stories, well, you'll hardly believe it. Come back next week to find out why I said it that way. You really won't want to miss it. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My production assistant is Lorena Garcia, and Emma Battaglia provided research for this episode. The voice of the Zodiac was read by Jack Roberts. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>